Hey, my friend, welcome back to another video. I've got an exciting video for you today. It's time for us to do another book review. I love doing these book reviews for you. And today we've got an exciting book. We are going to review the Old Testament book of Job. Now, Job is a very, very exciting book because it basically asks and answers the question, why would a good God allow bad things to happen to quote unquote good people? So we're going to start off by going over the general outline to the book of Job. Now, Job can be broken up into five basic sections. First and foremost, section number one, Job is tested for his faith, and that's going to be the first two chapters. And then for the next 28 chapters or so, Job's three quote unquote friends, and you'll see why I call them quote unquote friends in just a little while, they have these conversations with Job where they're trying to figure out the source of Job's suffering. Why has God allowed all of these negative things to happen to Job? So that's a very, very long section, and it's broken up into three specific conversations that Job has with his friends. And then after that section, there's a very, very small section here where there's this fourth friend. His name is Elihu. He is the youngest out of all four of Job's friends. And he chimes in as he thinks about why Job is suffering. So we'll go over that in just a little while. And then finally, God answers back in three chapters. God has been silent throughout the entire book. And God now says, hey, Job, let me now interrogate you since you and your friends think you know everything about suffering. And then the last section of the book, Job is restored. So everything that he lost back here, he is going to regain at the end of the book. Now, that is the basic outline of the book. And now let's jump in. So what I want to do in this particular overview is a little bit different than I've done in the past. So in this particular overview, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over the basic content of the book and I'm going to leave all of the life lessons as it relates to how you can apply this to your life until the end. And that way we can focus more on what happened in the book first and then we can look at how it's relevant to your life. So let's jump right into this very, very exciting book. Section number one, Job is tested for his faith. And so we see here in the very, very first verse of the book, there once was a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. So here is a man who is very upright. He's blameless. He is righteous. He is very well respected. He's got a great relationship with God. And as a matter of fact, he was such a righteous man that even when his children sinned against God, he would offer the appropriate sacrifice to atone for his children's sins. Notice what it says here. When these celebrations ended, sometimes after several days, Job would purify his children. He would get up early in the morning and offer a burnt offering for each of them. Now, why would he do this? It says here, for Job said to himself, perhaps my children have sinned and have cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular practice. So he was a very, very upright and godly man. Now, unfortunately, one of the things that happens is whenever you are an upright person, you're a godly person, the enemy wants to attack you. He wants to attack your faith. And this is what we see happening. But what's interesting about this interchange that we're going to see between God and Satan is that it's actually God that boasts about Job and if I'm Job, I'm thinking, God, okay, don't put me out there like that, right? Like, so, so, okay, I know I'm a righteous guy, but don't put me on, out here just as a sitting duck for the enemy to attack. So the devil enters in here now. And notice it says, then the Lord asked Satan. So it is God who is initiating this conversation with Satan. Have you noticed my servant Job? He is the finest man in all the earth. He is blameless, a man of complete integrity. He fears God and stays away from evil. Now, like I said, if I'm Job, I'm like, God, no, don't say that about me. Okay, leave me alone. Let me enjoy my wife. Let me enjoy my kids. Let me enjoy my wealth and my health and my prosperity. Don't put me out there like that, right? So Satan answers and he says this, yes, but Job has good reason to fear God. You have always put a wall of protection around him and his home 
and his property. So Job basically says, hey, or excuse me, uh, Satan basically says, God, the only reason why Job is worshiping you, the only reason why he fears you is because you have put protection around him. You've given him everything that a man would ever want to have. Of course he's going to worship you. Of course he's going to obey you and serve you. But notice what Satan says. You have made him prosper in everything he does. Look how rich he is. But God, reach out and take away everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And so now Satan basically challenges God and says, God, listen, the only reason why Job is fearing you is because you've set him up, you've hooked him up, he's got everything, he's got a dream life. But I guarantee you, if you start taking things away from him, he is going to turn on you and he's gonna curse you to your face, and this is the whole premise of the book. It is some sort of hidden dialogue, hidden uh, conversation or battle, if you will, between God and Satan. And Satan's goal is to prove that when men are not totally blessed and in the favor of God, they will turn away from God. And God's point that he's trying to prove is that men love me because I am God and not because of the things that I can give them. Now. Let's keep going. God's response is, all right, you may test him. The Lord said to Satan, do whatever you want with everything he possesses, but don't harm him physically. So Satan left the Lord's presence. So God gives Satan permission to attack Job and his family, but not Job's body physically. All right. Now, what happens next is Job's worst nightmare becomes a reality. Now, if you are a parent, what's going to happen to Job is the worst thing that any parent could ever imagine happening. So notice what happens here. While he was still speaking, another messenger arrived with this news. Your sons and daughters were feasting in their oldest brother's home. Suddenly, a powerful wind swept in from the wilderness and hit the house on all sides. The house collapsed and all your children are dead. I am the only one who escaped to tell you. Now, let's just sit in this for just a moment. Let's just rest in this for just a moment. I want you to imagine if you are Job, and I want you to imagine if all 10 of your children died on one day. Just imagine if only one of your children were to die. Here is a man who is suffering an immense amount of, of, of pain because in one fell swoop, all 10 of his children died at the same time. So now in the next chapter, God gives Satan permission to attack Job's body. And so notice it says here, Satan replied to the Lord, skin for skin, a man will give up everything he has to save his life. So Satan's perspective now is, okay, God, check this out. I've attacked his wealth. I've attacked his family and his children, but you know what? If you allow me to attack his physical body, he'll turn on you right away because a man will give up anything to save his own life. So notice, finally, Job's wife speaks. And oftentimes, Job's wife gets a bad rap because we look at some of the things that she says and, and it's as if we want to point the finger at her as if she's not some sort of spiritual woman. But we have to remember that she just lost her 10 children as well. She just lost all of her health. She is now looking at her husband's physical boils on his skin, and she is dealing with the grief of this particular loss. And she says this, his wife said to him, are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Why don't you just curse God and die? I mean, that, like I said, that sounds so harsh. But here is a woman who's speaking out of her own pain of losing everything that was near and dear to her. Now, this is when Job's friends start to come on the scene. Notice it says here, then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and nights. No one said a word to Job, for they saw that his suffering was too great for words. Now, their friends actually start, excuse me, Job's friends started off pretty good because they did the first thing right. Whenever you see someone who is suffering in pain, sometimes there aren't any words that you can say that are going to comfort them. 
And so you need to just be there in their midst, letting them know that you are there in terms of uh, the ministry of presence, right? And so they realized there was nothing they could do to comfort Job, and so they sat with him for seven days. Now, that is the first section of the book. Now we're going to pick up some ground now in looking at the second section of the book of Job. And this is when his three friends chime in, and all three of them think that they know the very purpose of why Job is experiencing suffering in his life. So some of them are nicer than others, but all of them are very, very uh, rude and not sympathetic to what Job is going through. Now, let's first take a look at his one friend, Eliphaz. And his basic message is this, Job, you are suffering because of your sin and you deserve what you're getting. Now, I don't know about you, but this is, this is a very, very um, insensitive thing to say to somebody who just lost everything, who has boils on his skin, so on and so forth. He's basically saying, Job, it's your fault. There must be some secret sin. There must be something that you've done to get all of the pain and all the suffering that you're experiencing because God doesn't just do this to innocent people. Matter of fact, notice what he says. Stop and think. Do the innocent die? When have the upright been destroyed? So Eliphaz says, Job, just think about it for a second. Based on what you know about God, would, would God allow these things that you're experiencing to happen to people who are innocent, people who are good, people who are upright, people who are blameless? No, that's not the God that we know. And so because of that, Job, there must be some other explanation for what you're going through. And that explanation can only be that you are a sinner and you deserve the suffering that you are going through. And notice he also says this, but consider the joy of those corrected by God. Do not despise the discipline of the Almighty when you sin. Now, this is a funny one to me because now this guy is basically saying, hey, Job, you should be happy that God is disciplining you because God only disciplines his own children. He only disciplines those whom he loves. So the fact that God is disciplining you for your clearly obvious sinful behavior is just proof that God loves you and that you are a child. So you should actually be celebrating that God is correcting. You should be happy. You should have this joy. Very, very insensitive thing to say to somebody who just lost 10 children. Okay, so he also says, is it because you're so pious that he accuses you and brings judgment against you? No, Job. It's because of your wickedness. There is no limit to your sins. So here's a guy who thinks he knows everything. He thinks he knows the plan of God. And he's basically trying to suggest that this is why Job is experiencing the suffering. That is why you are surrounded by traps and tremble from sudden fears. That is why you cannot see in the darkness and waves of water cover you. Notice how, how uh, arrogant this guy is. He thinks, he's, he's saying these statements as if they are fact, statements of fact. He says, this is why, that is why, that is why. He thinks he knows exactly what God is doing behind the scenes, and he has absolutely no clue. Now, there's another friend that comes on the scene, and his perspective is very similar to Eliphaz, but he's a little bit different. He comes from a perspective, he says, Job, perhaps your children have sinned, and that's why you are suffering. Right. So he comes at it from a slightly different perspective and he says, well, maybe it's your children. Now, notice it says here in chapter eight, your children must have sinned against him. So their punishment was well deserved. So now it's getting worse. I mean, this guy just lost all 10 of his children. And now you're trying to suggest that his deceased children were sinners and that's why they deserve to die. Once again, very, very arrogant and very, very self-righteous and insensitive. Now, there's a third friend that comes along, and Zophar, he's similar to the other two, but he was the least sympathetic of all three of Job's quote-unquote friends. Very rude in terms of how he dealt with Job, and let's take a look at what he said. If only you would prepare your heart, Job, and lift up your hands to him in prayer, as if Job had never done that yet, right? Get rid of your sins, and leave all iniquity behind you. Then your face will brighten with innocence. <laughs> I mean, I literally, I'm reading these things and I literally can't believe that any one human being 
would say these type of things with this type of tone to another person who has experienced this level of suffering. Now, Zophar also says this, you will be strong and free of fear. You will forget your misery. It will be like water flowing away. Your life will be brighter than the noonday. Even darkness will be as bright as morning. Now it's Job's turn to respond to all of the foolishness that he has just heard from his three so-called friends. Now, if you read the book of Job throughout, just chapter to chapter, you'll see that Job's responses are interwoven in between all of these different conversations that he's having with these friends, but I group them all together here for organizational purposes. So let's just see how Job responded to his friends. And first and foremost, we're gonna look at how Job responded to God, and then we're gonna look at how Job responded to his friends. Notice that Job says here, if my misery could be weighed and my troubles be put on the scales, but I don't have the strength to endure. I have nothing to live for. So he says, God, uh, if I could just take all of my struggles and all of my sufferings and all of my pain and put them on a scale, there would not be a scale that would be big enough to, 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 to uh, measure the weight of the pain that I'm dealing with. And then he goes on to say, you know what? I have nothing left to live for. I have no more strength to endure. I don't have any reason to continue to want to live. He goes on to say, oh God, remember that my life is but a breath and I will never again feel happiness. Wow, that is a very, very powerful statement to say that God, you know what? I am never going to be happy again. This man has lost all hope. He's at the verge of losing his faith, and he doesn't believe that life is going to get any better than this. And I don't know if you've ever been there. I don't know if when you're watching this video, you've experienced a Job type of situation in your life. And maybe you're dealing with that right now. Maybe there's something in your life that's going on, and you are saying these words, and you're wondering if life is ever going to get better for you. Well, I pray that the story of Job can encourage you. Let's keep going. He says here, if I have sinned, what have I done to you, O watcher of all humanity? Job is saying, God, listen, if I have sinned, then I, I want to know what the source of my sin is. Like, what was my sin? What was it that I was doing that caused me to deserve all the things that I am experiencing? Why make me your target? Am I a burden to you? What do you gain by oppressing me? Why, God, do you reject me, the work of your hands, while smiling on the schemes of the wicked? So Job is pouring out his heart to God. And as a matter of fact, at one point, he even regrets that God even caused him to be born. Why then did you deliver me from my mother's womb? Why didn't you just let me die at birth? So he's expressing his frustration to God himself for even being born. Now let's take a look at how Job responds to his friends. He says here in chapter 16, I have heard all this before. What miserable comforters you are. <laughs> Job just basically comes out and says, look, y'all not helping me. Y'all not helping a brother. Like if y'all supposed to be comforting me in this time, it ain't working, right? Y'all need to try a different approach because it's not working. You all are miserable and you're making me even more miserable. Notice he says here, I could say the same things if you were in my place. I could sit up and judge you, right? I could spout off criticism and shake my head at you. But if it were me, I would encourage you. I would try to take away your grief. Job says, listen, if I were in your shoes, I could say all the same things that you're saying about me. I'm a sinner. I deserve this. It's my fault. God is angry with me, God is disciplining me, God is punishing me. But he says, hey, if I were in your shoes, I would try to focus on bringing you comfort and helping to alleviate some of the grief and the pain that you're dealing with. Yet Job has hope. And this is the beautiful thing about Job. Even in the midst of all of his suffering, in the midst of all of his pain, in the midst of all of his difficulties, we still see a sliver of hope. Notice it says here, but as for me, 
I know that my Redeemer lives, and He will stand upon the earth at last. And after my body has decayed, yet in my body I will see God. And my friend, let me just encourage you that if you are struggling in your faith today, there are two ways that you can fall. You can either fall forward or you can either fall backwards. Falling backwards means you're falling away from the faith. Falling forward means you still have your struggles, you still have your pains, you still have your difficulties, you still have your confusion, you're still questioning God, but you're leaning into God, you're pressing into God, you're still expressing your faith to God, even in the midst of very, very difficult and dire circumstances. Now, notice here, we come across one of the most beautiful chapters in the book of Job, and it's Job 23, and I really hope that these words resonate with you. Notice it says, my complaint today is still a bitter one, and I try hard not to groan aloud. Job says, I'm trying to hold in my anger. I'm trying to hold in my complaints, but the pain is just so great. If only I knew where to find God, I would go to his court. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like, man, if, I, if only I could find out where God is, then I would plead my case to him and try to explain to him and try to convince him to treat me otherwise. He says, I go east, but he is not there. I go west, but I cannot find him. I do not see him in the north, for he is hidden. I look to the south, but he is concealed. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like no matter where you look for God, you can't find God? You go to church, you can't find Him there. You try to open up your word, you can't find Him there. You try to pray, you try to fast, you try to worship, you try to talk to your Christian friends, you try to talk to people in your small group, and no matter what you do, no matter where you go, no matter how much you search, you still cannot seem to find God anywhere. And that is the feeling that Job has to wrestle with. But notice what he says next. Such a beautiful statement. But he knows where I am going. See, he says, God, even though I don't know what you're doing, even though I can't follow your plan, even though I can't figure out what you're doing, I know that I have not gotten out of your side. I know that you know where I am going. I heard the old folks say this, whenever you can't see God's hand, you can trust his heart. You may not be able to see his hand in your life, but you can always trust the heart of God. And when he tests me, so Job understands that this is a test that I'm going through. I will come out as pure as gold. I love Job's resolve. He says, hey, because I'm being tested at this point, and I know that I'm being tested, whenever I come out of this test, I am going to resolve to make sure that I come out as pure gold. For I have stayed on God's paths. I have followed his ways and not turned aside. My friends, whenever you and I are dealing with stress and strain and pain, it's easy for us to turn away from God and go and live a disobedient life. Because in our minds, we are thinking, it didn't help me by obeying God. Obedience to God got me right here. So what good is it for me to continue to try to obey God when obedience to God is what got me in this particular situation. So I might as well just disobey God because my obedience didn't get me anywhere. So now let's keep going. I have not departed from his commands, but have treasured his words more than daily food. So we see here that Job is experiencing this, this, this pain in his life, and yet he is making a resolve to live a righteous life. Now let's move into the third section of the book, and this is where Job's fourth quote-unquote friend actually starts to chime in, and we're not going to spend a lot of time here in this particular section, but let's learn a little bit more about this new guy. He's a younger guy, and his name is Elihu. And so it says right here, Elihu, son of Barakel, the Buzite, said, I am young and you are old. So I held back from telling you what I think. Probably a wise move, right? When you're a young person, older people oftentimes don't think you know what you're talking about. So it's, it's probably a wise thing to kind of hold back a little bit and not be the first one to speak. So Elihu says, because of, out of my respect for you all who are older, 
and you are more seasoned and have more wisdom. I've been sitting here listening to this whole conversation and I've been holding my tongue. But guess what? It's time for me to tell you all what I think is going on. He says, I have listened, but not one of you have refuted Job or answered his arguments, right? He said, none, none of y'all have refuted him, right? So, so basically, Elihu's message can be summed up into three statements. Statement number one, Job's friends are wrong. So he's the one saying, hey, look, look, I, I know Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, I know you all think you know what you're talking about, but you all are all wrong. And Job, you're wrong too, because you're claiming that you haven't sinned. And clearly you've sinned just like the other three guys have said. So they got it kind of right, but you're wrong as well, Job. And the last point I want to make is that God is great and he's just. God is just. So listen, guys, and listen, Job. If you're going through what you're going through, it's because you deserved it. And, and, and if, if you didn't deserve it, then you wouldn't be experiencing it because we know God is a just God. He's a fair God. God gives people what they deserve, right? So that's his message. So now we move into the fourth section of the book, and this is actually an interesting section of the book. It's somewhat sarcastic because God challenges and starts to interrogate Job by asking him a series of questions, none of which can Job answer because Job is not sovereign as God is. So notice what it says here. Where were you, Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much, right? Since you and your friends think you know everything, where were you? when I laid the foundations of the earth, uh, I don't think you were around, were you? And Joe, while I'm asking you these questions, where does light come from? And where does darkness go? Can you take each to its home? Do you know how to get there, right? And I'm sure Job is sitting there thinking, man, I, I feel real convicted now because I don't know the answer to any of these questions. I'm getting a straight up F on this test, right? He says, can you make lightning appear and cause it to strike as you direct? So Job is not able to answer any of these questions clearly because Job is not God. He's not all knowing. He's not sovereign. He's not all powerful. And as a result, Job is humiliated. Now, we're going to move on to the next section of the book. The final section of the book is Job is restored. Job is restored. Now, I want you to notice there before we get to his restoration that Job realizes that he's met his match. He realizes that he was out of place and out of line for questioning God and questioning God's goodness and asking for his birthday to be uh, destroyed and, and, and thoughts of suicide and all the different things that he was experiencing and charging God to be wrong in terms of what he was going through. So he says, I know that you can do anything, God, and no one can stop you. You asked, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I. It is me, God. And I was talking about things I knew nothing about. Things far too wonderful for me. You said, God, listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. So we see here that Job expresses his humility and his his uh, apology to God for questioning God and his motives and his decisions. And then Job experiences this restoration. So the Lord blessed Job in the second half of his life, even more than in the beginning. For now he has had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 teams of oxen, and 1,000 female donkeys, all of which were more than he had originally had. And notice, he also gave Job seven more sons and three more daughters. So just as Job lost 10 children at the beginning, God blessed him by restoring him with 10 more children. Now, while I'm here, I just want to speak to this for just a moment because some people might think, well, Job should be so happy and he should be so excited because, hey, he lost 10 children, but you know what? By God giving him 10 more, that should alleviate the pain of the other 10. And it doesn't work like that, my friend. If you've ever experienced the loss of a child, or maybe you've, done, uh, you've experienced a miscarriage or something, or a stillborn baby, God can give you three or four or five children, but it doesn't replace, it doesn't negate, it doesn't get rid of the pain of a child that you may have lost. 
So we celebrate that Job experienced this restoration in his life and notice that the end of his life, Job lived 140 years after that, living to see four generations of his children and grandchildren. Then he died, an old man who had lived a long, full life. So, my friends, that is the basic overview of the book of Job. Now, I've been holding back because there are some major life lessons that I want to encourage you to really consider and prayerfully apply to your life if you are in a place where you're really experiencing a difficult experience in your life. I'm going to give you seven of them, starting with this one. Lesson number one, an upright life doesn't protect you from pain. Now, I want you to remember, if you remember the very first verse in the book, there was once a man named Job who lived in the land of Uz. He was blameless, a man of complete integrity. He feared God and stayed away from evil. So oftentimes we can think that if I live an upright life, if I obey God, then God owes me something. God owes me a wife. I remember I used to think that whenever I was single. God owes me children. God owes me to have perfect health. God owes me to be in prosperity. But why? Because I have lived an upright life, and therefore, God, because I have, you need to hold up your end of the bargain and give me a nice, easy, pain, and stress-free life. And it doesn't work like that. As a matter of fact, God promised, in his, promised us in his word that those who live godly will be persecuted. So that's the first lesson we can apply. The second lesson, and this is a tough one, is that it is possible to worship God in the midst of your pain. I want you to notice here what happens at the end of chapter 1. Job stood up and tore his robe in grief. Then he shaved his head and fell to the ground and cursed God and complained and shook his angry fist in the face of God. No, worshiped. And this very well may be one of the most difficult things for you and I to do whenever we're experiencing pain in our lives is to find some semblance of spirituality within us to be able to lift our hands and worship because this goes against the grain of everything that we feel like we want to do. Deep within our hearts, we don't want to worship. We don't want to pray. We don't want to read our Bible. We don't want to go to church because we're suffering, we're in pain. But Job shows us that even in the midst of life's greatest pains, we can still worship God. Here's a third lesson. Practice the ministry of presence when people experience pain. Remember this verse, then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and nights. No one said a word to Job, for they saw that his suffering was too great for words. You know, sometimes whenever we are trying to comfort people, we think that we have to say all these things to them. Well, this person's in a better place, or you know what, God will never put on you any more than you, you can bear, or hey, just trust God during this time. And none of those things are gonna make that person feel any better. And we would be much better off if we would have just kept our mouth shut and just uh, essentially ministered our presence to that person practicing the ministry of presence, just letting that person know that I'm here for you, I'm with you. You're not in this thing by yourself. If you need anything from me, I am here. I will be present with you. Here's another lesson we can learn, is that God can handle our expressions of grief and pain. Sometimes we think that God is just some big baby and that God can't handle our pain. And we can't express to God how we're truly feeling. Well, I've got news for you. God already knows how you're feeling. God already knows your pain. God already knows that you're hurting. He knows that you're angry. So guess what? In a respectful and honorable way, it's okay for you to express yourself to God when you're experiencing pain. God is big enough to handle it. Notice it says here, what I always feared has happened to me. What I dreaded has come true. Now I pray that your greatest fear 
would never actually become a reality. I pray that your dreams would never turn into nightmares. But I want to ask you a question. What is it that you fear more than anything else? How would you respond if your dreams turned into nightmares, if your greatest fear, the thing that you have always feared, became a reality? Here's another lesson. Our true friends are revealed in our darkest moments. You see, it's easy for people to say that they are our friends whenever things are going well, when we're experiencing prosperity, health, and wealth. But our true friendships are revealed in our deepest pains. I want you to notice here how Job's loved ones treated him whenever he was dealing with his difficulties. In chapter 19, Job says, My relatives stay far away, and my friends have turned against me. My family is gone, and my close friends have forgotten me. Now, if that's not bad enough, right, for your relatives and your family and your close friends to have forsaken you, if that's not bad enough, notice what it says here, a little bit of humor here. My breath is repulsive to my wife. I am rejected by my own family. Wow. I mean, can you imagine that the one person that you would want to be able to sympathize with you, your very wife, your spouse, and you can't even get close to that person because they see you as somebody who is repulsive. And that is the level of pain that Job was dealing with. It wasn't just pain from the loss of his children. It wasn't just pain from losing all of his sheep and cattle and all of his prosperity. It wasn't just the loss of his physical body in terms of the boils and things like that. But now he was also grieving the fact that people who he thought were his friends and family members and relatives and close friends were now seeing him as a reject and treating him as such. The sixth lesson, God's plans are not always something we can see or figure out. You see, sometimes we want the answers to all of these things that we're going through. And, and, and we, we think that there must be some reason that we can figure out if we can try harder to try to discern and figure out God's plan. But sometimes, my friend, whatever you might be going through isn't something that you can figure out. Even if you are trying to do everything you can to figure out why you're going through what you're going through, it very well may not be something you can figure out. And then this leads me to my final lesson of the book. We may not ever get the answer to our why God question. This is critical because oftentimes when we're struggling, we find ourselves asking the question, why God? Why me? Why do I have to go through this? Why am I suffering? Why am I experiencing pain? Why did I have to lose this person? Why did I have to lose my job? Why God, why? And you know what? Maybe there will be some times in your life where God will give you the answer. But more often than not, you will never get the answer to why, God, why. See, we have the luxury of looking back at the life of Job, and we're able to see what God was doing behind closed doors. We were able to be privy to that conversation that God had with Satan in chapters 1 and 2. So as we read the book, we understand what God was doing. But Job lived in it, and he had absolutely no clue as to why God was allowing him to experience his suffering. And by the way, God never explained himself to Job. God never gave him the reason for why he was dealing with the pain he was dealing with. So my friend, I hope that you got value out of the book of Job in this overview. The book of Job is an amazing book that I want to encourage you to study on your own, particularly if you are at a place where you're experiencing suffering, you're experiencing pain, or maybe you know someone else who's dealing with this level of suffering and you want to know how to comfort them in their time of grief and pain and despair. I encourage you to study the book of Job. It will change your life, and I hope that this overview provided more value for you so that the next time you read or study Job, you have a better perspective about the message of Job. I'll see you in another video. Bye for now.